Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This is MTA International USA Studios in Silver Spring, Maryland. My name is Ahmed Khan, and I will be moderating today's discussion on Islam Ahmadiyya in America. Our esteemed panelists today are Brother Al Haj Habib Shafiq of Orlando and Brother Al Haj Yaqub of Milwaukee. Brother Al Haj Habib Shafiq served in the education industry as social services professional, social services consultant. He acquired his master's in public administration. He worked in city government planning, special projects planning. He's a world traveler. His passion is community service and education. In his off time, he loves to cook and garden. Brother Al Haj Yaqub is served in the military during the Vietnam era, served as an executive management proprietary schools, worked in the nonprofit for 10 years. He worked at quality control in the American Society of mechanical engineer as a code inspector. He's a writer, he's a thinker, and a scholar. In the previous episode, we came to the conclusion that it was our, uh, that the teachings of the promised Messiah uh, that were inclusive in the Ahmadi Muslim community that brought and attracted the spiritual human beings to this community. And in, in return, we changed the system in return. It was not the other way around. We highlighted that with the jazz era uh, uh, period of time where there were a, a, a number of people from the African American community primarily who were jazz musicians and he converted over to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So with that, uh, we learned that their behavior and, and, and personalities, uh, when they were accepting of the promise, message of the promised Messiah, they changed their own system and industry in return, and it was not the other way around. And with that in mind, it allows us to see how the quality of our mes message was still being the success of our community. And with that, we will explore the decade of the 1960s, and we'll see how our quality of message never changed. It was still the same message, and we weren't really successful because of our numbers. So with the first question, I would like to go into the discussion towards Brother Biba. What kind of effect did it have on individual members of the Ahmadi Muslim community in the U.S.? at the time of, and this is something that was uh, a very Im, uh, uh, important time, but a, a very fearful time, the passing away of the second Khalifa. So what kind of sentiments uh, would the members of that community m might have at that time uh, that might not be even possible to explain in words? And also because they might have never seen the second Khalifa as well. So can you kind of give a perspective or uh, introspective on that? Well, thank you. The last part of, of your comment question was that they'd never seen him was irrelevant to those individuals at the time. The effect and the progress and just the overall contribution of not only was he the second Khalifa, but he was the promised son. There were prophecies about him being the Fazli Umar. So remember, those are early converts from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. The only leadership and the only um, uh, relationship with Khalafat that they had was with this Hazrat Khalif Tumasi, Sani, may Allah uh, rest his soul. That, that was the first thing. So there was, of course, this, un, this uncertainty because we were not, at the time, used to this kind of discontinuation and did not understand the, the quickness of the continuity of Khalafat. I'll give you an example in my own household. Uh, my father accepted uh, at, uh, during the time of that, that Khalafat. My father was not a, an emotional, sullen, a uh, person bent to um, weeping and crying and sullen disposition. When Khalifa Sani passed, there, were, there was just this sadness that, ha that was occurring in our household from our father. And it was six of us boys, 
and it affected all of us because we had never seen our father it was in, this way. Innately understood. Not innately. It was very pronounced, pronounced that his, my beloved Khalifa, and he would just, in our prayers, he would just be moaning, and he was he lost emotional control while li leading the prayers. We had this was not something very silent and quiet. So, and what I can say is two things: is that. The second Khalifa was all we knew to that point. And in our own household, we saw our father, who was a manly man, just absolutely broken and, 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 and like he didn't know what he was going to do. And it was... Was that very, exhibited in his body language? Not just his body language, in his words. Uh, he didn't want to eat. Uh, but my, and my father always gave very long prayers. And as boys, we, we thought that our father prayed too long. But in his prayers, my father would be weeping and and crying out to Allah about this 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 the loss of of uh, the the Khalifa and he made my mom find all of the pictures and, and he started pulling out all the pictures and all the memory letters that he had no sir this was not just something quiet and sullen and and dignified my father this this affected my, our household <clears throat> um, brother Yaqub yes sir there's a, a message that in going off of, uh, of the passing away of the second Khalifa, then quickly, in, in a very uh, quick and expedient fashion, the Jamaat elected the third Khalifa, Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmed. May Allah have mercy on him. And in, in his respect, uh, he gave a, an address directed to uh, the United States. I'm going to kind of read you a, a quotation of that. Uh, address and it says <clears throat> he's, he said in um, the address uh, <clears throat> it is for you to remove the idols of class and color race and prejudice from the hearts of men and women and bring them back to their creator can you kind of give your analysis of how was that an uplifting uh, keeping in, in mind of what we discussed in the past, that the message was still the same, that whether it was the Khalifa or the missionaries, they were reiterating those same words of equality within our community. Right. Uh, keeping everything in, in, in context of the times, this was in the middle of the civil rights era, and uh, that particular message that was given by the Khalifa was re really the signal of where we should be in those times. That is, is that we should be the example of equality. We don't have to hang our heads for any other reason or any other concept other than being men who are serving their creator. That's the basic message that I'm, that we receive from that. As a matter of fact, Many of, uh, uh, of the new converts during that particular period came from organizations that were driving the civil rights uh, movement. And the civil rights happened in 1964. 64, 1964. Uh, they signed the uh, civil rights legislation. And so uh, as a result of some of the COINTELPRO uh, to break up these organizations, uh, there was uh, uh, members who came into the Ahmadiyya movement who were in fact wanted to carry on a revolution and when they came in there wasn't a bloody revolution that had to be carried on it was a spiritual one that they were introduced to and so they learned how to do that and that and they pushed that forward and this was the message that helped uh, help transition many people. And it's also interesting to know that we were always ahead of the time. The Civil Rights right. Act happened in 1964. Right. They finally get to, got to understand that racial equality is the way to go. Right, exactly. And we were saying that message for the last 50 or 60 years. Exactly. Um, within the message of what Islam has taught us. Right. Brother Habib, um, with these conventions that were taking place, annual conventions in the community, Yes. yes. Did this help uh, increase our intercollaboration as Ahmadi Muslims or members of this community and also connect us more? 
The conventions um, were fun, and I remember them being um, a time of much excitement, and what they did, two things that I remember. First, you would not only meet and see people that you knew from the previous year, but then there would be new people that you would be introduced to. But what it did with respect to organization is that it began to introduce us as a collective that was united under this banner called the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam under the Khalifa of the time. And while we had different uh, basketball teams or football teams in our cities, we had different shapes of our mosque, etc. We came united under this banner of Islam and Ahmadiyyad, and you would meet new friends, you would meet old ones, and, and, and as importantly, what was the new book? You would go to that person from Pittsburgh, do you guys have a copy of this this yet? Or did, have you seen X, Y, and Z? Or did you, did you see what, um, the, the, these words in the Gazette, et cetera? So the, the convention became that place where we would meet, did you share the good news. Did you enjoy them too as well? Oh my goodness, you, you wouldn't go to sleep. You would have to come home to get rest. <laughs> you, would, you, you would not even go to sleep. You would be up talking, comparing things and this and that. And those of us who were younger coming there, we did not dare jump into the conversations of our elders because we were not read enough. Our elder converts, while they came in may considered uh, um, um, illiterate, they had a Islam and, and Ahmadiyyad gave them a literacy that was beyond college education. So you just didn't walk up to Brother Sadiq or Brother Muzaffar or, or some other elder and just, uh, Abed Hanif Saab, and just start talking and jumping in. You, you were listening, you were learning things, they were quoting books, they were quoting this, and they always, always, always quoted the Holy Quran. And this was the extraordinary thing so about it. So it's several benefic benefits to the community, um, not just the intercollaboration. It looks like there was spiritual benefits Absolutely. too. There yes. were social benefits too, because yes. you were meeting uh, yes. the, some people yes. that you might have not known yes. before, and now you can get to know yes. them. And also the, uh, the exploring or uh, increasing your horizons on understanding. And, and things. one last one you forgot is that was we begin to see Ahmadiyyad as a divine system. System and not just a uh, unit. Absolutely. It, it, we, all these parts from different cities came under this banner and set under uh, set in this one body, and it was absolutely so it's exhilarating. Speaking, it was speaking exhilarating. of systems, yes, uh, brother Yakub. Um, in uh, and I want to kind of set set the stage for. Uh, that uh, we're, I'm going to talk about auxiliaries, specifically the men's uh, youth auxiliary. Um, I want to uh, make a point to let everyone know that before 1969, uh, only National MKUSA office was of, of Motamids, who is the secretary of Majlis e Khudam al Amdiya, and who acted or worked with missionary in charge as Naib Sadr of the International Sadr or President of the men's youth organization mm -hmm. of um, the Muslim community. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. But um, in 1969, we were officially uh, made into our, uh, uh, we established an organization where we now, there was a national guide. Right. And it, it was not a Naib Sadr anymore. And the first um, uh, national guide was Munir Hamid. Um, right. And my question is, with this introduction, and he had to establish just kind of a couple of things. He established his own departments, which we did not have before, like enrollment, like uh, enrollment, uh, keeping track of uh, the numbers of our of the community, uh, religious instructions, propagation, just to name a few. Cooking, ziafet. Cooking, um, <laughs> those kinds of uh, uh, things that we, as a auxiliary men's youth auxiliary, had to uh, manage and help the larger Amadi Muslim community. So, in, in, in t with that introduction, how did this aux auxiliary set the stage to help the Amdi um, Muslim community even further? We, we established that Lejnai Mala, which established, in, uh, the women's auxiliary was established in 1950, uh, created that, uh, the better half of, of us to help with all of our uh, efforts in the propagation of Islam Ahmadiyya. How did 
Majlis or men's youth organization did do that for us? The main uh, thrust that uh, Munir Hamid uh, gifted us with was, um, it's captured in his motto, he used to always say, let the workers work. Now, we were young men, and the Majlis Kudama Ahmadiyya that was introduced to us gave us structure and discipline and helped us take that youthful energy and guide it in to meet the aims and objectives of the overall Ahmadiyya right. Muslim community. Quite. I think that that was the... the Absolutely. The, and I was a new convert. I ex, uh, had ex, uh, signed to buy it in 1969. So uh, being on the ground floor, I thought that this was great. This was something that... Did it I, help with obedience? Oh, boy. Yes. It, it was a matter of, of uh, how do you... One of the tenets of Islam, obedience, so I'm saying, did it help with, uh, with that and to inculcate that value into We them? were introduced to the concept of uh, obedience to the Khalifa. And um, that obedience didn't mean that we were robots or something like that. We were encouraged to think, but we were uh, introduced to a, an order, and there was a head and that we had to uh, 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 receive instructions, which we did, and we had to carry out uh, a certain task. And uh, Munir was the type of person that encouraged us to work. So he didn't want us to just sit around and do anything, and one of the challenges that he had was, this was new, brand new, and for many, the formulation of the Mahdist Kodama Ahmadiyya was going against uh, our elders who thought that we might be a breakaway organization or something. That was kind of my next question. What kind of challenges was he having? Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 in many respects, some of the elders who, uh, th they, they treated us as if that they were our fathers. And when you start talking about the Majlis Kudama Ahmadiyya, and we had our own organization and thing, that was kind of taking them back. They didn't quite know how to deal with that at first. And so we were formulating our own, the, our constitution was introduced to us, introduced to us, uh, the aims and objectives of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as far as what the youth, what their role was. And that was uh, captured in a phrase that the Majlis Kudam Ahmadiyya was the backbone. Backbone. And as the backbone, we and, did... And to be clear, it's an auxiliary, yeah, which right. is assisting the community in whatever it needs, what its needs are at the time. Right. And it reports directly to the, the Khalifa of the time. Exactly. So that was the big pr main purpose of an auxiliary. The big picture, yes. And it, you, just, you said it perfectly. It was the backbone, backbone of, of, the the, movement. of the movement. Right. Um, I, I, I want to kind of... Uh, uh, talk about something external that was happening on the side. And it was uh, with the popularity of a, a very influential person called Malcolm X. The reason I want to kind of see this, because he grew in popularity. In fact, his movement actually grew in popularity because I don't want to talk about the movement itself because that's not relevant within the discussion. But uh, just to set up a framework, he attracted people like Muhammad Ali. Um, <clears throat> what was uh, the attraction behind this uh, this person, who um, who also increased the status of his uh, his movement? There's an Arabic term that we use, kaula sadid, and that's to speak the straightforward talk, and that's what Malcolm was very good at. He was good at being able to analyze something, whatever it is, it may be social or economic and then be able to give it back to an audience in a language in which that they could understand. And that was very straightforward and very direct. That was number one. So that uh, goes with the teaching of kind of like Islam, speak oh yeah. the straightforward word. Right. And that's what we were doing in the beginning when Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Saab or right. uh, Mutiya Rahman Bengali 
they they were d doing the same thing. They were very straightforward. Very straightforward, but very direct. But Haji's point here is that this was an Afro-American, and he coined that term, speaking to power, speaking to the white power structure with that kind of straight bareness and talking about race the way we talk about it today. This was unheard of and extraordinarily dangerous, but it also had an attraction. The, 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 I'm glad you brought that out. The other factor was that what Malcolm introduced, and it's an Islamic concept, under Christianity, anything that happened to us, you would turn the other cheek and offer the other cheek for someone to beat up on you. Malcolm said, you know, you may slap me on one cheek, but I may hit you back. Now, what this did was introduce to the world that Islam is a peaceful religion, but in terms of being able to safeguard our families and our homes, we have an obligation to do that. That was revolutionary because uh, in the, uh, as uh, 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 people that have been uh, harassed, made slaves of, you were supposed to be docile and take anything that was given out and Malcolm was saying, we're not gonna do that anymore. So it, it kind of, uh, it kind of when, you, when you read about these kinds of things about him, it, it makes sense that he became very influential because of these very reasons. And um, there was an Ahmadi who contacted him. His name was um, Haji Hanif Ahmed, and he lived in. He, uh, he was from the, the Chicago, Detroit area, but he died uh, ultimately in Zion. But he met Malcolm, and uh, Haji, didn't you? You did an account of that at one. Yeah. Yes, uh, this uh, Haji uh, Hanif preached to Malcolm. He tried to convert Malcolm to Ahmadiyya. And Malcolm did not reject his message of Islam or Ahmadiyya. Mm -hmm. What he simply told him was, he said it was Elijah Muhammad who helped me and I couldn't turn my back on him. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the role that uh, Elijah Muhammad had in terms of being able to uh, reform Malcolm from a criminal bringing him out of prison and being a spokesman, uh, eventually being a, spokes a spokesman to his organization, Malcolm felt indebted to that individual for that. And so. remember also people, a lot of people at the time who were African American, they did not like Malcolm. They did not like Malcolm's straightforwardness. They, he was totally, totally different. He did not stay in a place. So Malcolm was not in, 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 in by no means just this overwhelmingly popular African American among Africa. Many thought he was considered a troublemaker and that Dr. <coughs> King was a more palatable solution for the so-called Negro problem. It, it gives us a new perspective that if you have, it's not just the individual that makes the message or the, you know, the community it is, the quality comes from uh, the divine help that the promised Messiah as a prophet, as a Messiah, had received and was reassured through divine help and that that would succeed in this country. Right. So uh, you can have great speakers, you can have yes. um, skillful uh, yes. orators, but the, the message has to be, uh, has to have the backing of, of, divine, of divine help. Exactly. And among ourselves, we talk about this and talked about it a lot, that essentially just this very point that you very uh, 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 wisely bring up, and that is that uh, when Malcolm really got to this point where he saw, he, he had this profound realization that the divinity that he thought that his movement and his founder had he did not have that. In, in speaking of uh, a broader... The, the, not divinity, divine support. Yes. Um, mm. Divine, divine support. support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in speaking on a broader perspective, uh, when we were talking about other Muslim communities, uh, were they even changing uh, the face of Islam in America at all? In, in any way, or um, uh, did they even focus on the part of the faith, or is it just still the same 
uh, they were growing as a community and it was a cultural thing and they had different agendas. From my uh, viewpoint, I think that these different uh, Islamic organizations were there to provide support to their ethnic groups. I didn't think it, it went any further than that. They I didn't would, have a mandate to preach Islam right. uh, to anyone. but just They were trying to assimilate and make money, honestly. Yeah. And it feels like it feels like that is the case in this decade of those, and it was growing in that direction. Right. Yeah. It wasn't right. growing in the direction of, oh, now we're learning and we should actually... That our principal objective right. is, is this... to spread Islam and bring back the... Ri no, no. <laughs> and so it kind of leads us to the final question. Um, was, our, uh, was our original message and or the quality of our original message, was that altered in any way in this decade? No. Not at we, all. As a matter of fact, it didn't got, change a bit. It didn't change a bit. It's still the same. It got a little sharper, yeah. particularly internally right. with our elders when right. they, they didn't understand what this this Kadamalama did. I remember my, uh, them thinking that we were just paramilitary, but so it got really sharp and a tes little testy with our elder Amadi olders, but, but for the most part, no, it became even more sharper, pronounced, because it wasn't just Malcolm, but it was other militant nationalistic groups that influenced. Brother Muzaffar was a, a, a colonel in the New Republic of Africa. Our Haji Aminala came from that organization, and more science. So it was a convergence of all these different uh, things into <laughs> Kadam al Into Kadam al Yes, and into in Kadam al In that convergence and our uh, constancy of our message, the quality of our message, it was building our, our success yes. more so. And again, it was not about the numbers. It right. was how we were reaching to people. And it started to create a yearning for who is this Khalifa? What is this Khalifa? I think we can conclude this discussion to say that definitely our uh, message was not changed. It was mm. still about the idea of a, having a universal message, a message of equality, and it was to uh, s to discuss Islam on the on the on the truest path, yes. on on its most purest uh, uh, convictions. So with that, we were reaching to people to their hearts and to change who they were, what they were before. So that was our objective originally, and that was the promise that uh, was given to the promised Messiah al Islam, right. that, that that is how the sun will rise in the West. Yes. So with that brief overview, you can find all of this information on www.alislam.org forward slash sunrise, or you can go to www.muslimsunrise.com. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. This is MTA International Studios, Silver Spring, Maryland, on Islam Ahmadiyya in America. Jazakallah. Jazakallah.